Okay, wow. So fun to be back with you guys again. I thought I'd bring my beloved Susan here. Uh, we have kind of gone back, we have gone back with you all, some of you, the older ones, I guess I'd say, uh, 37 years. It was 37 years ago that my brother was married on this platform. He was a part of International, and we both sang it. I played the organ. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, you played the organ back in the organ days. Remember the organ days? <laughs> and uh, it's been a joy to be with you all. Uh, wow, 37 years ago. And you guys have supported us for 32 years as the Lord has brought us through various countries, especially Singapore. We served for 30 years in Singapore. And this is where we raise our family. We have three sons, and uh, they, are, they are here uh, in, back in the States. And as of last month, all of them are married now. So we've gone through all these various uh, transitions. You guys have been there the whole time. We, we so appreciate that. Okay, I'll let you go back. And uh, as Scott mentioned, it's been four years since we've been here. We normally try to come every two years, but there was this a little blip on the radar, the worldwide radar. Uh, I think it was called something like COVID, something like that. Uh, and it kind of got us off schedule from seeing you every two years. In the last four years, we've seen four of our parents pass away. We've, uh, we've shifted, made a slight shift, right, uh, from Singapore, where we served for 30 years in the Chinese world and in East Asia, over to Jordan in the Middle East. And next month we'll be heading back to Jordan uh, after we have a third grandchild born. Uh, we're going to hold this guy and hug him and kiss him and then take the flight back. And... Uh, so we're here just in the U.S. for about four months, and we're here at International for eight more days. We'll, we'll fly out a week from tomorrow morning. But uh, this nice. It's nice to be able to reconnect with some, many of you we haven't seen for four years. And how many of you have come in the last four years? Just raise your hand. I'm curious how many have come to the church. Okay, yeah, about half of you. Uh, we're used to that because for the last 15 years we've pastored Crossroads International Church in Singapore until the Lord raised the, the right couple to take our place and we were able to be sent out to the Middle East. Uh, and we we're very familiar with the whole concept of international church ministry, uh, having planted a church like that and served for the years like that. So we understand how the coming and going goes. Well, he is here in the dark. He is here. You know that he's here. I guess if you didn't believe that, you probably wouldn't be here yourself. You wouldn't be here, right? But that's this series that we've been going through here at International. And it's the Christmas season. Uh, I, I love this time of year. It's, uh, and, I, and I wonder how you're doing. How are you doing here in this Christmas time? We're just right here on the first Sunday of December. Has someone asked you today, sincerely asked you, how are you doing? If someone said it really sincerely to you, I hope so. Well, I'll ask you, how are you doing? Uh, you know, Christmas can be, we, we have all this joy of Christmas, but sometimes Christmas is, um, we feel that we're really supposed to be joyful and all that, and, and we want to say, blessed Christmas to you, or at least Merry Christmas, right? But a lot of times we don't feel so merry during this time. Um, and... I don't want to start off, you know, really morbid or anything like this, but I did a little research this week. Do you know what week of the year more people die than any other week? It is the week from December 25 to January 1. Yeah. Yeah. And the, these researchers are trying to figure out, well, why do more people die on Christmas Day to New Year's Day? And I don't think they figured it out. But I think a lot of it is that we feel like we're, we're supposed to be filled with light and all this, but then actually things are pretty dark in our lives. And things don't, oftentimes don't really change that much by the time you get to December. Do you, uh, do you need light in your darkness today? I'll tell you, I do. I need light in the things that are confusing me and the darkness that's, that's, that I'm experiencing. Do you need to, uh, to break away? Do you need to break through your darkness today? 
Maybe you need to be rescued from the dark of uh, (laughs) seemingly extra doses of stress. Christmas could do that to you. Do you need freedom from the medications that control you? Medications like, like coffee. You know, it's a medication, right? Um, how about deliverance from concerns uh, about what's happening in your family, uh, in your job, in the country? How about, does anyone here just need light from your struggle with plain apathy or discouragement? Some of you perhaps even feel like Rudolph. You know, instead of Rudolph, all of the other reindeer used to laugh and make and call him names, you know. They don't anymore because Rudolph got the upper hand, you know. And some, sometimes we can even feel like that during this time of year. The feeling the darkness often happens during December more than any other time of the year. Um, now, I'm not going to focus on the darkness today. I think we know enough about darkness. But we know that light is the only thing that can dispel darkness. So today, we're going to focus more on the light. All right? I hope you'll enjoy that. <laughs> that's what you need. That's what I need. But what do you do when you need security? It's When you're in darkness, you can feel kind of insecure. You can feel like, wow, I need some, I need some light here. I need a deliverance from this feeling of insecurity. And what do you do? I mean, there should be something we should be able to do about that, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're in our Christmas series called He Is Here. I think that's a great name for the series. It's not He Was Here and we celebrate, oh yeah, Jesus came 2,000 years ago. It's not... He's going to be here, although he is going to be here again, but he is here now. Emmanuel means God with us, God with us now. And what a wonderful truth. Uh, And I think Scott's wise to have this as the the theme for these various messages on on Christmas. So today we're going to look at a, a people in Isaiah's day, 8th century Judah, all right? So we're going to be all pretty much in the book of Isaiah today, different passages. But what were they struggling with during that time when they actually had more struggles than we have today? Struggles for the, the actual existence of their nation. So let's journey back to 8th century BC to a stressed out Judah. All right? Here's the context of what was happening with them. There was a major power to their northeast called Assyria. And these people, headed in Nineveh, were conquering nation after nation in a westward march. They had conquered their way all the way to just north of Judah, uh, north of Syria. And Syria and Israel felt threatened by the Assyrians, just as Judah did. And so there was a 12-nation alliance that was being formed, but Judah refused to join this alliance. Uh, Not that they were trusting the Lord, the king, Ahaz, instead decided, I think I will go around Syria and Israel to my north, and I'm going to give money to the Assyrians so that the Assyrians and the Israel and the people in Israel wouldn't put pressure on me in Jerusalem. That was Ahaz's idea. And the Assyrians said, thank you very much. We appreciate all the money. We were planning on conquering Syria anyway. It's so nice to get paid for it. <laughs> so they conquered Damascus, the capital. They put, uh, they put Israel under nine years of tribute where they have to be paying money to their aggressor. Imagine paying money to your aggressor. Judah was actually feeding the aggressor, Assyria. And the big talk at that time is not too unlike what we have happening in our own country here, and that is where to turn. What do you do? What do you do in a situation like this? Some people were saying, we should turn to Egypt. Egypt's very strong. We should should kiss up to Pharaoh because 
Pharaoh's got the kind of army that can defeat the Assyrians, and so we need to put our trust in the Egyptians. Others said, no, 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 we shouldn't be trusting the Egyptians. Um, we need to instead look at the, um, the necromancers, the, the mediums. They will tell us what to do. And so we see in Isaiah 8, verse 19, he says something quite interesting. Uh, this, is, this is what he says to, to tell these people what to do in their darkness. Someone may say to you, let's ask the mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. Right? That's, let's, let's, let's go talk to the dead. Right? With their whisperings and mutterings, they'll tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? Should the living talk to the dead? For, you know, guidance? And Isaiah, of course, says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. We'll go to the next verse, and this is what he says to do instead. Go to God's word. Look to God's instructions and teachings. People who contradict his word are completely in the dark. They will go from one place to another, weary and hungry, and because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down to the earth, but wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They'll be thrown out into the darkness. Not bad advice for us too, right? In times of difficulty, maybe what we should do is go and see what God says. Maybe we should see what his word says, because there we'll find instruction. So that was the end of Isaiah chapter 8 that sets the picture for us into what we're going to focus on today in Isaiah 9. So rather than placing their security in all these other things, Isaiah 9 answers this question, what do you do when you need security, by, by saying simply this. Security is found in the strangest places. It's often found in the place that you would never expect. That's how God works. Uh, deliverance is oftentimes not in what we would consider the traditional places where we're going to find deliverance and security and light in our darkness. What he told them is he said that Judah shouldn't look to the big powers, but to Galilee. I think most of us will go, well, Galilee, okay, we understand. Yeah, Galilee's kind of in the northern part of Israel. And, but we have to understand how the people looked at Galilee. What was the big deal with Galilee? It was, typical, it was certainly not the place you would normally go to look for security. Let's look at what Isaiah says in, in verse 1 of chapter 9. Isaiah 9, 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when, Gen when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. And then verse 2, the people walking in darkness will see a great light for those who live in darkness. A light will shine. What is the solution to darkness? It's obviously light. I remember some years ago when one of my boys was really small, I was, kissed him goodnight and I was about to leave the room and he said, Dad, Dad, don't turn on the darkness. <laughs> and I said, uh, son, um, darkness is kind of the, the default. Uh, you mean don't turn off the light, right? Because light always dispels darkness and it was actually, it was a good teaching moment. Well, the typical place that people would not look for security was Galilee. Galilee was there up in the north, and this place was trampled by all the pagan uh, peoples that would ride their camels all the way through Israel. They actually, whether it's invading armies or for trade, this was the area that was not looked at as a place where you're going to find security. Certainly not on the main road where all the invading armies take. Is that where you're going to find your security against the main, these invading armies? Not really. And what he's saying here is that 
the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun will be hum- were, hum- were humbled in the past because of all these armies going through them. And it's going to be humbled in the, in the future. Um, and that's because it's on the way of the sea. You'll see in verse, uh, the end of verse 1. That's the name of the main highway that went from Egypt up to what we would call modern-day Iraq, or in their times, Assyria and all that. It's called the Way of the Sea because it was the main coastal road along the water, and then it diverted into Galilee, uh, and that was the place God said that deliverance was actually going to come from there in, at the Way of the Sea, the pagan highway. And I think a lot of people will go, what, Lord, are you sure? They thought of security in terms of fortresses, right? Uh, Being behind a walled city was really, really helpful when you got an invading army coming. And Galilee uh, was trampled. Galilee was on the... It was in a place that lacked fortresses and there was no place to hide up there. And it was a Gentile area. So God is saying to these people, in, these Jewish people in Israel, my deliverance is going to come from the Gentile area. You know that Nazareth, the city where Jesus grew up in Galilee, was actually the Roman garrison for the region, for Galilee? Jesus grew up with all kinds of Roman uh, soldiers around him because that was the, the Roman capital, you, if you will, of that area. What an unlikely place to think that the Messiah was actually going to be born. What an un- unlikely place for God to do his work. But God often gives us deliverance in the strangest places. And the Jews were looking for security anywhere but from Galilee. It would be like this church saying, oh, there's an attacking army coming. We're going to turn to punch bowl. Yeah, the cemetery will really help us. I think others will go, oh, I'm not sure you really have things screwed in tightly up there to think you're going to get deliverance from a cemetery. And yet God's deliverance from Galilee would result in wonderful blessings. The, the nation would become larger, for example, He says here, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. He's saying, from Galilee, when I do my work, it's going to, the nation is going to be much, much larger. Now, we normally think of blessings. uh, How do you get blessings? Well, we go to heaven, right? We have to leave this earth. We have to kind of climb up the ladder, whatever, and get to heaven. And that's where our our blessings are going to come. But this is actually a very earthly scene. He's saying that Judah, that, opera, that, that had the smaller area there in the land of Israel in the south, that it would actually be expanded all the way. We see this all the way, way to the north. We see in the last two chapters of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47 and 48, how God spells out exactly which tribe is going to live where, and it goes way, way up there, way expanded. I think you know, Ezekiel wrote more than 100 years after Isaiah and he gave more revelation about this. He says not only will it become larger, but the place will be filled with joy. This is an internal thing. When Messiah comes to this deliverance, one of the blessings is going to be joy. This is the joy that you have at the harvest. So he says in verse 3, he says, they will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. It's sort of like for us, it would be the harvest is maybe when you get the transmittal of your salary into your bank account or you get your paycheck. Isn't that nice? I mean, everybody likes paychecks, right? Oh, no, got another paycheck. Nobody ever says that, right? (laughs) You know? Uh, and, And he says their joy, they will rejoice like when they divide the plunder. Maybe the paycheck is like the plunder and you can divide it up in your family or something. I don't know what the parallel would be there. But the, the idea here is that we, um, when we see God's blessing in our lives, there's a, there's a rejoicing that comes. There's a joy that comes. So he says that you'll be, they'll be filled, they'll be larger, they'll be filled with joy, 
And no other nation also will oppress Israel, as we say in verse 4. And no more oppression. No more other, other nations coming in and taking their, care, their territory and ruining their land. He says that uh, like they were enslaved in Egypt in verse 4, he says that for you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. And, and then the, the, the end of the verse is, you will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. This is looking back in the book of Judges when Gideon was used to defeat Midian. And God brought a great victory there. In fact, this lack of oppression from neighboring from other nations is even going to go into the animal kingdom. I kid you not. Isaiah says it in two chapters later in chapter 11. He says, and the wolf, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. You say, well, wolves dwell with lambs right now, don't they? For about one or two minutes until the lamb becomes lunch. We don't have wolves living with lambs today. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. We have leopards lie down with dead young goats today. But we're talking about live animals here. And the young lion and the fatling together. And he goes on. He says, and a little boy will lead them. A little boy is going to lead a lion. Now, do you think that's happened yet? We've raised three sons. They're all in their 30s now. But we've taken them to many zoos. But I've never put them in the lion's cage to say, hey, let's see if this verse is uh, applied yet. I believe that this verse hasn't really... This is a future, this is a promise of what's going to happen yet future. When God does his wonderful thing after Jesus' return and there's a peace that we have never even imagined. Even lions will be tamed. Uh, as you go to the next verse, you'll see what he says here is that also the cow and the bear will graze. I've never seen a bear graze. And their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Last time I checked, lions were not really interested in straw. You know? But this is a, a, an earthly, amazing scene that actually harkens back to what we have before the fall when the animals were, were all vegetarian and they were all tame before Adam and, Eve and, Adam and Eve sinned. God says it's going to happen again. Amazing, amazing. And Isaiah 65, 20, you have to jump several verses, still stay in Isaiah, says something absolutely amazing. It says that we will have incredibly long life. Never again will there be in Jerusalem an infant who, die, who lives but a few days, no, no babies dying, okay? Or a man who doesn't live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. You got it? Everybody's living past 100. I can envision the, the man who says, well, his, this is my daughter, still single, 119 years old, and uh, marriageable age, and, you know, and still looking pretty good at 119 or whatever, you know. This is an amazing, amazing picture here. Now, it's not the eternal state where there will be no death. You know, death will be eliminated in eternity. People will be dying, but they'll be living far longer than we live today. Again, back like we see in Genesis, where people lived hundreds of years. God says it's going to happen again. And, and Isaiah 2 notes that the law will go forth from Zion. That's teaching based from Jerusalem, Zion, that will impact the whole world. Uh, when you get to Revelation 20, you see the length of this time period is, is called a millennium. It's a thousand years. And what an incredible time that will be. I think these are all expansions, uh, other passages that are saying what, what Isaiah is saying here in our chapter today. 
In fact, the rebuilding in the earth, it's going to need to happen here after God judges this world, the rebuilding is going to bring about uh, a whole new earth. We will have peace in the animal kingdom. We will have peace in our human kingdom as well. In fact, military uniforms will not be needed anymore. Obviously, if everybody's at peace, why would you need military uniforms? Verse 5 says, uh, it says, the boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They'll be fuel for the fire. This is how you get <laughs> fuel. Burn up all those military uniforms. We don't, we don't need weapons. We don't need, uh, we don't need uniforms. What a wonderful thing. Now, here's a question. Were these verses fulfilled in the first century? Because it's a little bit interesting when you get to Matthew chapter 4, Matthew quotes Isaiah here. He says here in Matthew 4, he says, Jesus went to Nazareth and then he left there and moved from Capernaum beside the sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And this fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah. So you have that, those two regions there, the, the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And he's saying Jesus moved north east up to the top of the Sea of Galilee, in the land of Zebulun and of Naphtali, beside the, the sea, beyond the Jordan River in Galilee, where so many Gentiles live. Now, I am convinced that verses 1 and 2 were, were fulfilled at the coming of Jesus. Not so convinced that verse 3, 4, and 5 were fulfilled, where the nation has the, the, the boundaries, where the nation has the... Uh, um, peace among all the others, we certainly, it should be obvious, I guess, to us that that has not been fulfilled yet. But God says it is going to be fulfilled. So we're looking at a partial fulfillment here. And verses 3 to 5 promise Messiah's yet unfulfilled victory over all of Israel's enemies. But the point here, of course, is that Israel was seeking their security in the wrong places. Uh, people kind of tend to do that. Back then, you know, back then they were seeking security in the wrong places. But today, we have learned nothing. You know? Uh, and where do we put our security today? Well, there's a whole lot of suggestions. Uh, we have, I think Satan's quite creative in getting us to place our security in just about anything but the Lord. But one of the areas that I know for myself, I have been tempted to place my security in is government. I grew up in a very, very idealistic idea of our U.S. Uh, government. And I thought, well, yeah, things are crazy every other places in the world, but they're not crazy here at least. <laughs> Such is the way I, th I thought. And then there was this election that came about in the year 2000. And this cartoon showed up in the year 2000, okay? It's, a, it's the Santa's reindeer. I want to show you this cartoon. Look, it's Santa's eight tiny reindeer. Well, it looks more like 12 to me. I'd say 47. And then one of the reindeer says to his friend, yep, we're in Florida, all right. For those of you that were voting back 22 years ago, the, the Bush-Gore election came down to Florida just a hand, to just a handful of votes, and they kept counting the votes. I think it was seven, maybe eight times. They kept counting, changing the rules each time to try to figure out who's going to be the president. For me, that was, helped me to realize, don't put your ultimate trust in government. <laughs> the government's going to fail you. And so here we are in another election year, and we're still counting votes. You know, it's been a month now. Uh, except for, Florida's learned a few things, and now we have major problems in Arizona that still hasn't counted. People just, you know, math is in short supply nowadays. <laughs> we have a hard time counting. People don't count as well as you used to back then, you know? But I, all this helps me to, to just say, well, where's my confidence? Where's my, where's my security? Where do I place my security? And honestly, the Lord has rebuked me for saying, Rick, why did you think that your security was in government? It never has been. 
ultimate source of security. Thank God when government for, functions well, but don't put your ultimate security there. Government's not the only place. A lot of times we put our, our confidence in military. I heard one person say to me once, he goes, well, our, our military are so strong that we can defeat enemies that are far larger than our, us. And I thought, wow, you're a Christian and you're saying that. We, do, you, you've got to realize it doesn't always happen that way. Israel was, or Judah was tempted to put their security in their allies. If we just have these other nations that we all bind together, we have the, the friends all trust one another, uh, then everything will be great, as we see it is in the EU, right? <laughs> as we see in the G7, as we see in all these alliances we have today, they provide such security for us. Do they not? I didn't hear an amen there. You know? Uh, some of us put our security in our organization. I, have, I, I try to be a very organized person, but you know what? Organized people fail as well. <laughs> some churches are organized to death. A church is supposed to be an organism, not just an organization. And a lot of times we put our, we put our trust in our leaders, especially in leadership transitions. We can often say, well, when this new leader comes, we can place our trust in, you know, give the name of that leader. I've learned that it doesn't work like that. Ultim I thank God for good leaders, and I'm so thankful for Scott. Scott, I really thank God for you. I was really concerned uh, a few years back, seven years ago, I guess, you've been here seven years, uh, what was going to happen with international and moving into the new generation of leadership. Thank God for Brother Scott. But as, as godly as he is and as much as he's seeking the Lord, don't put your ultimate trust in him. Right, Scott? He's saying, yeah, don't. Don't put your ultimate trust in me. Uh, a lot of times we put our, our, our trust in our savings. And we go, well... Things are going crazy, but at least I've got money in the bank. And no, but none of us says, yeah, but that money is worth hardly anything compared to what it was two years ago, you know? And I mean, these sort of ways that God, I think, gets our attention and he, and he says, your future, your security in the dark doesn't come from all these other sources of security. They are not really ultimately the sources of light for you because security is found in the strangest places at least to us. So what do you do when you need security? This is the question that we're still addressing here in Isaiah 9. What do you do when you're in the dark? And frankly, every one of us is, is, is in the dark to some degree. We, none of us here knows the future, uh, at least in lots of areas. We know what the Bible says about the future. That's wonderful. But when we uh, find that Security is not found in those normal places. Uh, we've seen already that security is not found in the normal places. The, it's found in the strangest places. It's found in the most unusual places. So what is one of those unusual places then where we do find our security? Well, when you, verses 6 and 7 tell us when you need security, look to the child. <laughs> you feel insecure? Don't worry. There's a baby. There's a baby who will turn all things around. Babies are just great, right? So what would I tell you if I, if I told you, put your trust in a baby ruler? Maybe you would say, well, babies don't rule, do they? They drool, but they don't rule. Um, and, and yet, as even, as, even as I think about it, I think, well, we've had three babies that kind of ruled in our house. Um, that was more than 30 years ago. And I remember when a baby was hungry for milk, um, Susan obliged, you know, she was, I mean, we didn't like noise. When a baby's diaper was needed attention, we jumped to the opportunity before things got worse. <laughs> when uh, 
we were in a public place and our babies, have you noticed babies don't ever seem to get embarrassed about anything? You know, but we did. We got embarrassed and, uh, and we tried to do whatever we could to, um, to re- remedy the situation. And pretty soon I began thinking, hmm, maybe babies do rule after all. Of course, you know I'm just joking about all this. Uh, the idea here is that it's not that the baby himself is going to rule, it's that the baby's going to grow up. You have to look ahead, right? You have to envision what this baby is going to do. So think ahead. I'm just talking in jest here. You have to think of the potential of the baby. You have to envision what that baby is going to be like in the days ahead. Just like a, when you look at a cocoon, you say, boy, there's not, not much potential there until you realize that in the cocoon, a butterfly is actually going to come out and be a, uh, the beautiful result of kind of an ugly cocoon is a wonderful butterfly. And it's, it's the same thing about that, about this baby who's going to be a real ruler here. The one who will meet all of Israel's needs is a child who will rule, who's going to grow up. He will be born a child. Look at verse 6. This one's very familiar to us in our Christmas season here. It says, for a child is born to us. Okay, so he's going to be human, right? A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Mighty Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, uh, he's the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We need to understand what each of those is saying. So, how much is a baby worth? You know, babies are valuable. In the UK, some years back, they they tried to put a dollar figure on the worth of a baby. Okay, so they they assigned $62,500 for a baby in their society in, in Britain. 275000 for someone who's 30 years old, working and producing, and uh, hun- minus $180,000 uh, if you have retired. Doesn't that make you all feel good? You know, uh, those of you over 60, you have minus 180000 value. And I thought, uh, you know, this was some years ago. I wasn't, I didn't pass 60 <laughs> at that time, but I have since. But I looked at that 62,500, and I thought, how could you? Our, all three of our sons have been precious. Every one of them's been worth far more than 62,500. I mean, how can you, how can you put a, a, a dollar figure on that, on a baby? That just seems incredible to me. Certainly, they were worth a lot more. Your, your kids have been worth a lot more than that as well. A baby is valuable. But here's the point. Do you look to a baby to help you in times of trouble? Imagine me tell you that it, telling you that an invading army is coming, okay? But don't worry. Susan and I, three years ago, our son gave birth to our grandson. And his name is Jesse. He has the same name as the father of David, the warrior king. And Jesse is our deliverer. Our three-year-old grandson. Don't worry, don't worry. He will deliver us. How many of you are convinced? You have very heavy hands, right? Nobody wants to raise their hand. This is what Isaiah was really saying to the people. He's saying, we have all these problems. We're in the dark. But don't worry. God has a baby coming from the line of Jesse. He will save us. He will rule over Israel. And we see this idea of ruling in terms of the government being on his shoulders. You know, kings wore robes, and their king, this is, this is a figurative way of referring to the kingly authority of Messiah. We typically put signs of authority on the shoulders of generals, of, of heads of state, and that kind of thing. You see their authority based on how many stripes and stars and all that on their shoulders. I think this is the idea we, we, that still carries on with us today. And then there's four titles that are given for this baby. 
that are, when you think about them, absolutely wonderful. Well, that's the name of the first title, Wonderful. Wonderful Counselor. Do you need a wonderful counselor? Oh, so many times I need counsel. I need, how wonderful to, to realize that Jesus is the one who is a wonderful counselor. Uh, incredible, you could translate it, incredible counselor. And not only is he counseling, the idea is that people will actually be listening. You know, we see in Israel, in, in our country, in many countries, people elect leaders and then they tear down the leaders that they elect. You've seen it happen all your life, right? So you wonder, if the person got elected, how do we tear down the person that we've elected? We don't listen to our leaders. But Jesus is going to be one that we really should listen to. He's mighty God. In other words, he has ultimate power. It's one thing to have good advice, to give good advice, but God does more than that. He has the power to enact what needs to be done. And then the third, the third title is Eternal Father. That one's a little bit, maybe a little bit strange when we think about it being applied to Jesus because we say, well, Jesus is, he's the son, right? He's not the father. I think the idea here is more of his fatherly rule. It's not that this is talking about re Jesus' relationship to other members of the Trinity. It's more Jesus' relationship to time. And if you put it in the, the context of the Davidic covenant, this promise given to David years earlier, it says that David was a promised, a descendant who would rule forever. And we know that Jesus is that one who will rule forever. In that sense, he's like each eternal father. And then finally, Prince of Peace. Ah, security at last. People not killing one another. Nations not going up against one another. War. I look forward to that so much. Now, Jesus is going to bring a worldwide peace that no one else could bring. In fact, when he comes back, he is going to go through the East Gate in Jerusalem. That gate's been sealed up for 400 years now. And in fact, the Muslims have placed a, put a Muslim graveyard in front of it because they say, Messiah won't come and walk over a graveyard in, through this gate. Good luck on that one. Uh, Jesus is going to do it. He's going to do exactly what Ezekiel 43 says. The glory of God is going to come through that Kidron Valley and go on up and go through the East Gate, just like, just like it says. What a wonderful thing. Um, putting all these things together, here's what one author, one author says. Let's see if I can wrap this, these four titles together. The government will be on his shoulders and he is able because he has the wisdom to be the wonderful counselor. Their oppressors will be broken in peace and force because he is the mighty God who is the father of eternity. Only God's son is so wonderful that he has the wisdom to rule the nations, the power to produce peace, and the supreme authority over all eternity. And that's why he's called the Prince of Peace. So what about these two key titles, Wonderful and Father? Wonderful actually is the title of God mentioned in Judges 13, 18. The father of Samson has an appearance by an angel, and he asks the angel, what's your name? The angel says, wonderful. It's too wonderful for you to comprehend. That's pretty encouraging. <laughs> and then he says that Jesus has this title, Father of Eternity, referring to his supernatural authority over everything. Wow. From eternity to eternity, from the past to the future. What an amazing thing. And so the, the passage we're going to look at today ends in verse 7. So here's, here's how verse 7 reads. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. 
the passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Four things I want to mention based on that verse. The reign of Jesus will be unlike any other reign. It will be uh, increasingly stronger. One of the translations says, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. It's going to just get stronger and stronger. His reign will fulfill all the promises of a righteous king. Aren't you about ready for a righteous ultimate leader? I am. I'm too informed about what's happening in, in the church as a whole, in government as a whole. I find some Christians say, I just don't even want to know. I don't listen to the news at all. That's the, you know, go bury your head in the sand approach. But I can understand why some people feel like that. Because we all long for a righteous leader who will be fair and give true justice. And then internal, wow. I, some of us might think, well, if Jesus is going to reign a thousand years, Revelation 20, well, how can this say he's eternal? A thousand years is just the first installment, friends. <laughs> it's just the beginning going on into eternity. And then he will be divinely empowered. The Lord himself will bring this about. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that. His reign will be accomplished not by man's power, but by God's power. This is a God thing. So amidst the many stresses that we have today and the ones that Israel had, God said that their deliverer would be a most unlikely candidate, a baby. <laughs> but I, don't, I wouldn't blame you if you said, well, how does all this baby stuff relate to me? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, our source of security at Ultimate is not a baby. It's in the baby who is mighty God who has grown up and who has given us these promises that, were, that are, I can't even communicate how incredible they are. Our security is found in Christ alone. Our security is found in the Messiah. Our victory in Christ is, is in Him. Knowing that helps me, really encourages me when I'm so disappointed in human leaders. Israel sought mediums, and they sought messages from the dead. They were looking up in the stars with what we would call astrology. Um, and what God is saying here is, don't look to the stars. Look to the sun. Not S-U-N. S-O-N. Your security is not found in somebody's mutterings saying, oh, this is your future based on these alignments of stars and planets. I wonder if you have this sense that Jesus is your security. There has to be some sense of, I think, humility for us to be able to say, okay, I don't have it all under control. I control some things. Maybe at least I deceive myself in thinking that I control some things. <laughs> but ultimately, Jesus is the one who has things under control. Are you trusting him for the deliverance that you need today? Are you trusting him for the darkness you feel in your own life and the things you struggle with? I think essentially what we can say of these verses, these seven verses we looked at in Isaiah 9 is this. I would sum it up this way in terms of the main idea. When you need security, look to the child. I know that may sound really strange, that security would be found in a child, but notice there's a capital C there. It is not just any child. Deliverance is in Christ, the child who grew up. Jesus has come to be the light in our dark. He is the one we can turn to for security. Honestly, he's the only one who can light up this dark world that we experience today. The poet said it well. He was born of a woman so we could be born of God. He humbled himself so we could be lifted up. 
He became a servant so we could be made heirs. He suffered rejection so we could be his friends. He denied himself so we could receive all things. Now more and more among us are freely receiving all things in him. I'm, uh, I'm really encouraged in where our, own, our own ministry among, among Muslims and the, the, ta- the, the amazing openness we find. We live in a country of 98% Muslim. And yet I find no more open place that I've been in the world to hear the message. And it's a, it's a great message. Uh, we have two, conf- what, which may seem like conflicting pictures in, in Isaiah. We have the reigning Messiah, Isaiah 9, 7, okay? Reigning on the throne of David. And then we also have the Messiah who suffers on behalf of the people. Some people had a real difficult time saying, this is the same Messiah? I mean, one who reigns and one who suffers? Well, we have the advantage of being able to look back on it and say, wow, he's coming twice. Once to suffer, once to reign. He's the same guy. He's the same God-made man that we celebrate, especially this time of the year. So think of those four titles. Are you resting in this child? His titles affect you in really the most personal ways. The first we saw was Wonderful Counselor. Maybe you say, boy, Jesus, I need your counsel. I'm struggling with this. I don't don't understand this. I need your counsel. Can I encourage you to pray that? I need your counsel. Others of us say, wow, I know what I need to do. I just need him, the power to do it. He's mighty God. And maybe your, your prayer should be, Jesus, I need your power. Would you strengthen me? Would you make me able to do what you want me to do? Others of us are saying, he's everlasting father. I never really thought about that. Jesus is eternal from the past to the future. Jesus, would you rule over my life? I need your rule over my life. And others of us perhaps would say, I have anxiety. I need a sense of confidence to move forward in peace. Jesus, thank you that you're the Prince of Peace. I need your peace. Look at those four. Which one of those really impact you the most today of these titles of Jesus? Can I encourage you to pray that on your own? And then I'll close in prayer. Just pray those words. Jesus, I need your and what he's telling you. Honestly, Jesus, we need you for everything. We need your counsel, power, rule, peace. Thank you for coming in the form of a baby, so weak, so fragile, so you could identify with us. And yet, thank you, Lord, that in your second coming, you will come with great power far more than any of us can even imagine. And we ask God that you'd help us to see you uh, in, in your son and to see your son in, in clarity in understanding both of these images, both of these realities. Meekness and power. Humility and the great way that you're going to work in the days ahead that we've had a short glimpse at in Isaiah chapter 9 today. In your name we pray. Amen.